Welcome to the Portland Pentecostals podcast. We're happy you've decided to join us as we build a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Enjoy the message. Happy Sunday, Portland Pentecostals. Good to be with you in the house of God. Please join me in reading from 2 Timothy chapter number 1. And I want to thank you all for giving to Christmas for Christ. Christmas for Christ is an is a offering of the United Pentecostal Church International. And in giving uh, to that offering, people have helped start churches all over North America. And in also in giving to that, our church received a $15,000 grant in 1991 to buy our first building, which eventually ended up with this church building, and it's great, and so we want to give back. Also, just a side note, thank you very much for my new suit. So that's what you bought me for part of, I added a little bit to it, and I bought a new suit for Christmas with the money that you gave me, so thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Paul is writing in First, Second Timothy chapter number 1 from a prison cell. So location is really important. So it kind of gives you the mindset that he might have. And many have wanted to distance themselves from Paul and his ministry, both out of fear that they would be in prison or persecuted or shame because here's my brother or my pastor for many of them. He's in prison now. But Paul is in the will of God and still having an impact on the kingdom of God through writing letters to the churches he planted and to the men which he is mentoring. And this is Timothy, his son in the gospel, to whom he writes in 2 Timothy 1 and 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. But according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So we understand is that the life that he was living and we put ourselves in this place as a church, is this was planned before there was even time. So before God said, let there be light, or the evening and the morning were the first day, this was in the thinking of God. So if we can grab a hold of that, it begins to make us understand that the church and we are definitely not an afterthought of God. But we were in the thought of God before the earth was created as we know it, but has now revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed." For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him until that day. Thank you for standing in honor to the word of God. You may be seated. Someone wrote a book in the early 90s and then a musical about how to succeed in business without really trying. It was a prescription for what an ambitious person without skills, talent, or brains needed to do to succeed. Anybody want to take that? It was a matter of being in the right place at the right time and saying the right things to the right people. It was amusing because it alluded to certain aspects of business that we all recognize and people sometimes fail their way up the corporate ladder. Others rise to their level of incompetence, and it is said usually by someone who is not progressing as quickly in their career, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that's my message today. It's not what you know, it's who you know. 
It's often been said knowledge is power, and there are times when knowledge is very powerful. And if you're facing a legal battle, it's a very empowering thing to have a well-trained attorney representing you. If your vehicle is in need of repair and you're, and you're well informed about the problem and the cost to repair the issue, knowledge is power when you go to the mechanics. If you are purchasing a vehicle and you have knowledge of blue book pricing, it may give you power in bargaining. And if you're bidding on a property, knowing the market conditions puts you in a place of power. These are all things that we accept. If we're fighting a war and you've been informed in advance of your opponent's strategy, you will be in a place of power to win the battle. And finally, if you're competing in a sporting event and you've watched the recordings of your competitor's playing style, your knowledge may give you a distinct advantage. Yet knowledge alone will not bring you to a place of power. Knowledge of some of the facts not, does not guarantee the whole picture. Understanding a portion of facts won't lead to absolute truth, and becoming a theologian may reveal facts, but facts do not necessarily draw one to the conclusion of truth. During the days of the early apostles, uh, there were those who prided themselves in the pursuit of information. And they failed to obey what they did know to be true, but they had the knowledge there in the brain. And they rationalized their disobedience. And Paul made this declaration concerning these men to his son in the gospel in 2 Timothy 3 and 7. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jamres resisted Moses, so do these men resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. In other words, he's saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. We can have all the information in the world, but if we don't know how to apply that information, that information has very little value to us. We can have all the information and all the truth in the world, but if we don't act on that truth, we will find ourselves outside of the walls of salvation. Facts alone will not save you. Information is powerful without application. Knowledge is just the beginning of journey, and knowledge has the possibility of leading you and I to truth. Truth, a truly knowledgeable man or woman, will act on the knowledge that they have received. The wise King Solomon wrote this inspired by the Holy Spirit in Proverbs 4 and 7. Wisdom is the principal thing or the most important thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and all you're getting, get understanding. In plain language, a wise man was informing us that knowledge is valueless unless we know what to do with the value, with the knowledge. Wisdom is knowing what to do with knowledge. The Bible talks about two of the gifts of the Spirit, the word of knowledge. God tells you something that happened that you could have never known happened without him telling. But then there's the word of wisdom, is what do we do in this set of circumstance or situation? I'd much rather have wisdom and the word of wisdom than the word of knowledge. I want to know what to do. Paul knew who he was. He knew why he was where he was, and Paul understood his purpose in the kingdom. So the question we have to ask is, do we know who we are, why we are where we are, and what our purpose in the kingdom is? In 2 Timothy 1 and 11, Paul continues to write and says, And God has chosen me to be his missionary to preach to the Gentiles and teach them. That is why I'm suffering here in jail, and I am certainly not ashamed of it. He knew his cause was righteous. He knew his purpose had value. He knew it was of eternal value. And so he said, it doesn't matter what I'm suffering. The cause that I'm involved in is worth the pain that I'm going through. The cause that I am involved in is worth the shame that others would heap on me. 
Because others tried to shame Jesus. They stripped him. They beat him. They humiliated him. They spit on him. They plucked out his beard hair by hair. They tried to shame him. But he endured the suffering of the cross, despising the shame. Knowing the joy that was set before you, him, which as we have said is you and me, is a redeemed body, men and women who aren't offering sacrifices of bulls and goats, but men and women who have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus through baptism in his name, and we stand pure before him. Those are wonderful things. So this knowledge granted Paul great power. Power over confusion, power over the spirit of depression, and the voice of his enemy speaking into his soul. It's very important that you and I know who we are. So I ask you, are you a child of God? Have you been redeemed from a life of sin? Have you been set free from the intentions of Satan? Oh, thank God if we have been redeemed. I'm so glad I've been redeemed that I am not what I used to be. Now, I'm not quite what I should be, but I'm sure not what I used to be. I am a child of God. We have received the spirit of adoption. But then the other questions are, have you found your purpose in the kingdom? And are you living with the hope of eternal life in Jesus Christ? Finding what our purpose is, is so important. Most importantly, Paul knew who he believed in. We read again the last part of verse 12 in the Living Bible. For I know the one in whom I trust. And I am sure that he is able to safely guard all that I have given unto him until the day of his return. Oh, it's not what you know. It's who you know that makes all the difference now Paul was a knowledgeable man before he came to Christ Jesus he had a lot going on in that cranium he says of himself he says I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees that meant that he probably had the first five books of the Old Testament memorized the Pentateuch go ahead stand up and begin to quote numbers 23 and 23 Paul could do it. He knew it. He had all that knowledge, but he was heading directly in the wrong direction. I repeat, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Again, Paul knew who he was, why he was where he was in prison, and he knew the one that he was there for because Paul knew Jesus. And Paul knew that Jesus would safely guard what he had entrusted into his hands. Paul knew that Jesus would be with him till the end of life's journey. And Paul knew these things because he knew Jesus. The most important thing you and I can know is to know the one that Paul trusted in. His name is Jesus. Paul hadn't just simply heard of Jesus. Paul did not just intellectually understand who Jesus was. But Paul personally knew Jesus. I want to say again, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I don't know everything to know about Jesus. I don't know everything about his word. I read occasionally and go, wow, that's something new. I hear somebody else preach and say, I never read it that way before. Somebody will give a name and say, pastor, who's that? And I'll go, what? I don't know who that is. But sure enough, their name's in the Bible. And I may not have knowledge and all knowledge, but I know who I have believed in. I know Jesus. Not just who he is, but I know him. Paul had had a personal encounter with Jesus when he was running in the wrong direction. It changed his view of religion and it changed his own view on life. This encounter with Jesus saved him from eternal damnation and brought him to the place where he was willing to receive instruction from salvation and led him to his real purpose which was not to put the people of the way in jail, but to walk alongside them and preach the gospel to the Gentiles and start churches all over Asia Minor and Europe and declare the will and the purpose of the Lord and write 13 books of the New Testament. But all of that said, he said, I know who I have put my trust in. I know who I have believed. It's amazing when we meet Jesus. When Paul met Jesus, he, he, he saw that light. He heard that voice and he said, Who art thou, Lord? 
that mean? You're superior to me. Whoever you are, you're in control right now. I thought I was in control. I'm breathing out threatenings of slaughter. I have letters from the government and from the high priest. But you stopped me dead in my tracks. And I heard a voice and saw a bright light. And now I can't see anything. You're in control. Who are you, Lord? Isn't that where we need to get with Jesus Christ to really know who he is? He is king of kings. He's Lord of lords. He is first above all. Oh, to know who he is. He's in charge. This encounter with Jesus brought him to truth. And the reason encountering Jesus is crucial to our eternal existence is revealed in a statement Christ Jesus made to his disciples in John 14 and 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. When we meet Jesus, we meet truth. Jesus Jesus was impacting his world. Many believed in him. And some of the Jews believed on Jesus. But they didn't know who he was. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Later on, we read in this say, or earlier in John 8 and 31, Jesus was speaking to the Jews and he said, If you abide in my word... You are my disciples. And if you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Again, it's not what you know, it's who you know. If you know Jesus, uh, if you know truth, uh, the truth makes us free. We know that we couldn't do penance enough to to pay for our sins. Uh, We know that we couldn't give enough money uh, to buy our redemption. Uh, But because we know Jesus uh, and we know truth, uh, we have salvation. But there was confusion in their mind. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The believers in the crowd misunderstood what Jesus was saying. They were thinking about the visible, visible, physical realm. They assumed that Jesus was speaking about physical slavery like their ancestors had suffered at the hands of the Egyptians. And they had been told stories of deliverance by the hand of the great prophet Moses. And so their response seems to be a logical one based upon this. In verse 33, they said, we are Abraham's descendants and we have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you, can, you will be made free? Now, this is pretty arrogant. Yeah. They were definitely in denial. Yeah. Now, you and I have never been in denial about anything. <laughs> denial is when you're putting your hair gel in and you're trying to wipe that white spot of hair gel out here and you realize you would be pulling your hair out because it's not going to disappear. Denial is when we step on the scales and we say, we really need to buy a new one. (laughs) Denial is when that idiot light comes on and the tank is at E or zero and you say, I can make it. That's denial. These people were in denial. We're children of Abraham. We have never been under bondage to anyone. Wow. But Jesus was not speaking about physical bondage. His mission was not about freeing men from physical tyranny. His mission was not about changing the political system. But the mission of Jesus was about freedom from sin and spiritual bondage. Freedom from a sinful lifestyle. Freedom from the eternal consequence of sin. The mission of Jesus was about freedom from sin and the gift of eternal life. This mission of Jesus was about freedom from sin and the hope of living with him in a place where the effects of sin would be absent. And so Jesus gives them understanding in verse 34 and he says most assuredly I say unto you whoever commits sin is a slave of sin and the slave does not abide in the house forever but the son does. Therefore if the son makes you free you shall be free indeed. In other words, Jesus is saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. If you know Jesus. You're slaves of sin is what he was saying to them. Now they were also in denial about their position physically. You see, the word free in the original language is eleutherio. It means to liberate, that is to exempt 
or to deliver or make free. The picture is one of a conquering king liberating the subjects of a kingdom that have been held captive. The vision is one of a judge or a magistrate that looks at an individual, calls them into the courtroom and declares that all the charges have been dropped. Therefore, all any and all penalties have been removed. The true word picture that Jesus painted to those uh, he was speaking to was, you can be free from all of the ceremonial law you have been following if you will follow me. He was telling the people they were in bondage, but he was the liberator. They were in bondage to Rome. And they were saying, we've never been in bondage to anyone. Isn't that crazy? We can be so in bondage that we're in denial. When we say, oh, I could stop drinking any time. Yeah, right. That's why you did, right? Oh, I, I can quit smoking any time. I, I, I can quit acting uh, immorally any time. But you don't. Why? Because you really don't have the power without Jesus Christ. Uh, he whom the Son shall be set free shall be free indeed. Because it's not what we know, it's who we know. It's the one that is our liberator. You see, this is a gift greater than coming to April 15th, 2023, and the IRS or, or the State Department con of Revenue contacting you and saying emphatically, you are income tax exempt. This is larger than the state revenue sending you a certified letter in the month of November stating that your property is tax exempt for life. Oh, those are two big pay raises, folks. No income tax and no property tax. This freedom that Jesus alone can give us is of eternal value because when we meet Jesus, we meet truth. We meet freedom from religious ceremony. When we meet Jesus, we meet freedom from sin and freedom from the moral liability of sin. When we meet Jesus, we meet exemption from the eternal consequence of sin. He that is dead or buried with Christ is freed from sin. And when we go down in the water in the name of Jesus Christ, we're buried with him. And when we rise again, the scripture says, we rise in newness of life. You see, that's why it's not what you know, it is who you know. The Amplified Translation of John 8 and 36 says, So if the Son liberates you or makes me you free men, then you are really and unquestionably free. There's no question. Nobody can say, go to jail. Nobody can say, those sins belong to you. Nobody can say, you're on your way to hell. Oh, thank God for the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. You may remember. Your friends may remember. You may still have a date in court uh, at Multnomah or Clackamas County Courthouse, uh, but Jesus is inside of your heart, uh, and you know you have redemption, uh, and therefore you have eternal life. Yes. I am so thankful that I know Jesus. John, again, it's not what you know, it's who you know. John the Apostle of Love confirmed this in his first open letter to the church in 1 John 5 and 11. And this is the testimony that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It really does matter who you know. If we don't have Jesus, if we don't have know Jesus, if we're not intimate with Jesus, uh, we don't have eternal life. Uh, but I'm so glad I can feel that intimacy today. I can feel the reaching of His Spirit to you and me, especially as we begin to exalt His name and we think about the liberty and the freedom that He has given to us. Perhaps that is why John did not flee when Jesus was being crucified. Maybe this is why John had the courage to stand at the foot of the cross and risk arrest and the possibility of death by beating of cru or crucifixion. Two years ago, our world and our nation experienced what the powers that be are calling a pandemic or an endemic. There were and are still many questions and there are still so many unanswered questions there are many conflicting answers, and, and ah, many people have lived in mortal fear, and some have lived in what they would call captivity. 
There was a lot of uncertainty. And in fact, in some nations, it's wild. It's like the mark of the beast has come to them in China. You know, you can't use cash in China. You can only use your phone to pay. So guess what happens if they shut down your phone service? That's how they're tracking everybody. And that, that, I'm going to make you scared now, huh? Turn off your location devices, boys. No, uh, but what happened is that that's the only way they pay. And so they've, they've locked them in their apartments out of fear of another outbreak of, a, uh, of COVID, another uh, variant uh, of COVID in uh, China. And if, if they leave their apartment, the cops know. And, and they can't go buy food because they have to take their phone. And, and they'll track their phone. And, and they're, they're captives. What a horrible way to live. Captive in their own houses. You and I will likely never have the answers and some of the truth will long remain shrouded in deception. And we've reached the other side of this pandemic mostly, but our world has changed. I still cannot tell you exactly what tomorrow will look like. There are still businesses that are dying and some that are talking about coming back, but... This reminds me of a biblical account of great trouble. God's children were in bondage in Egypt, and the captor did not have any intention of letting them go, and he had publicly and emphatically declared so. But God had every intention of setting his people free. Plagues or pandemics were sent by God. Great anger was shown by Pharaoh, followed by confusion and ultimate desperation. At first, God's children felt the brunt of the anger of God because their taskmasters made their task more difficult. And the first several plagues were unleashed in success and water turned into blood, frogs to lice, or uh, then frogs all over the land. And, the, and then he says, all the frogs are going to die everywhere else but in the rivers. And then they picked up frogs all over the place and they were in heaps. And the Bible says they stank. And then the lice came. Can leave. <clears throat> Church itching today. It's like, wow. Did you feel that? Did you want to check? Everybody suffered that throughout the whole land. But then a change came, and God made a separation between Goshen, where the Hebrews lived, and the rest of Egypt lives. And, and the plagues continued. The flies came in abundance. Then the livestock had pestilence, and boils came, and hail, and, and locust. But then a greater change came, and a plague of darkness came. And hear the word of the Lord in Exodus 10 and 21. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the heavens, that there may be darkness over all the land of Egypt, a darkness which may be felt. It's creepy. I mean, 5.30 this evening, it'll be dark and you kind of expect it, but what about at 1.15? And a shadow comes and you go, oh, that feels weird. But it was a darkness that could be felt over the whole land. And listen to what it says they did. And Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky. And for three days, a thick darkness was over all the land of Egypt. And the Egyptians could not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. So these Egyptians, who did not know the God of the Hebrews, were unable to live life as usual. And they sheltered in place. Does that sound familiar? They were paralyzed by fear and the entire nation was trapped. They had a lot of questions. They could easily see the problem, but they had no solution to problem. There was no way out for them. The Egyptians. But the Hebrews, it says in verse number 23 in the last part, but all the Israelites had natural light in their dwellings. How that happened? Let there be light. And there was light. That's, that's the first day, guys. Where's the sun, the moon, to govern? That's not till day three. So here we are. There's light, natural light in the dwelling of the Israelites. It's not candles. They have brightness. They can see what's going on in their dwelling. 
But the, 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 the Egyptians had no light in their house and no light in their land. I am so thankful that we walk in the light. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I must emphatically declare it's not what you know, it's who you know. The Egyptians had many places of higher learning. They were trained in mathematics and in science. You read it, even the prophet Moses was trained in their mathematics and in their science. How did they build the pyramids? How did they build all these great things? They were intelligent. But in this time of great darkness, you and I can have light light. We see a season of confusion and yet we can have clear thinking when men and women are trying to decide are we non-binary or is there only two sexes. When men and women are questioning if God even exists. If we are moral or if there is morality or if we are amoral. If we are eternal beings or we just live and breathe and die and that's all there is to it. I am so glad in this season of confusion, I have clear thinking. When fear comes knocking, you and I can have the security of God's love. And when your neighbors and co-workers are filled with questions, you can embrace the answer. It's time for you and I to rejoice in what we know. No, not in what we know, in who we know. I am so glad I know him whom to know aright is life eternal. And I must declare one last time as we stand, please. It's not what you know. It's who you know. If this is your first time joining us for worship service and you have not made your choice for Jesus clear, I have some questions for you. Do you know Jesus and the power of his forgiveness through repentance? If not, you can simply repent and find forgiveness. Do you know Jesus through the power of remission of sins through baptism? If not, I look before church. It's 98 degrees. We have robes. We can baptize you into the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And according to Romans 6, you come out free from those sins. Do you know Jesus in the power of his Holy Spirit evidenced by speaking with tongues? The only requirement for that is repentance from dead works and faith in Jesus Christ. And then opening up your heart, you can receive the Holy Spirit before you're baptized or you're promised it after you're baptized. So if you're a first-time guest or you've just been kind of hanging around the fringes, fringes trying to make up your mind is, do I want to buy this or do I not? Remember, it's not about what you know, it's who you know. If the answer is to no to any or all of these questions today would be a good time to make a change. Now would be a good day to submit to the Word of God and take the time to receive the Holy Ghost. Remember the words of John in 1 John 5 and 12. He who has the Son has life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's why we baptize into the name of Jesus Christ. You've got to have the Son. You've got to have Him. He's the one that died for your sins and my sins. Think about it this way. Paul had Jehovah God or his ideal of what Jehovah God was and his purpose locked in his mind. But he was denying the Son of God. He was denying Jesus. These people of the way, they're heretics, they're blasphemers. He was on the side of those that were, had crucified Christ. And of course, we see him in chapter number seven of Acts and he's watching the coats of the guys that are throwing rocks on Stephen after Stephen got done preaching a convicting sermon. And he's, yeah, kill him, dudes. He rejected Jesus. But when the bright light shined and the voice came, he, the voice said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. He says, you're just kicking against sticker bushes. You're, you're just kicking against the blackberries. That's pretty tough. And he told him what he needed to do. You need to go and you need to wait till a preacher comes and tells you what to do. And 
Ananias comes and says, See, you know, the Lord, even Jesus, who appeared unto thee, by the way, has sent me to tell you, you're going to suffer for the kingdom, but you're going to take his name before kings and governors. But Jesus told me he's going to heal you and he's going to take the scales off your eyes, but you need to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and receive the Holy Ghost. And that's not all said in the initial conversion, but Paul affirms it later on in his testimony. And Paul came to know who Jesus was. And after he was born again, not everybody trusted him. But the Bible says he spent three years in the wilderness with Jesus. With Jesus. That's what it says. He came and communed with him. And when he came out of the wilderness, he came out preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he knew who he was now. Because he knew who Jesus was. And he knew what his purpose was. And he knew that he would suffer. And he knew he would go to prison. But he said, that's all right. I'm bringing life to my world. I'm bringing hope to my world. I'm bringing the message of eternal salvation to my world. So to the born again believers that are here today. I want to say, when God showed Daniel the calamity of a future time, he declared the spiritual health of those who knew the right one. In Daniel 11 and 32, we read, Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. It's light and dark. Why? Because they don't know their God, but the people who know their God. I know that he is the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He is not just a king, but he is king of kings. He is not just a lord, but he is lord of lords. He is king of kings and lord of lords, and his name is Jesus. He's the one that we referenced his words two weeks ago when he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now is the time for God's light to shine and you and I are the light of the world. Now is time for great miracles, uh, for dynamic testimonies and notable conversions uh, and a harvest of unprecedented proportions. Uh, Let God do exploits through you. Uh, Embrace who you are in Christ. Accept your purpose, His purpose for your life and declare your loyalty to Him. You and I have life. It's time to rise up and reach out and declare our intentions and go in the power of the Spirit. So this altar is open for a multiplicity of reasons. Uh, If you just need to repent uh, and you need to clear it before God, you can do it. Uh, If you've already been baptized, you can just confess your sins. Uh, If you need to repent initially, uh, this altar is open. If you need to volunteer and say, okay, Jesus, uh, I'm ready for you to work through me. Uh, I'm going to be like Paul. I know who I have believed. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. We're in this for the long haul. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us who you are. Thank you for allowing us to know you intimately. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my heart safely trusts in you. My spirit rejoices in you, O God.